Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, you're a noble of a 14th century maritime kingdom that presides over the Indonesian archipelago. Now you're trying to win the islander's esteem by paying tribute to the island spirits, pleasing elders, tasking local nobles, fulfilling the king's decrees, and for holding a totem when any player pays tribute to that spirit. Buru is a competitive midway Euro style game for one to four players. It takes 60 to 90 minutes to play and is published by Crafty Games. Now this game is on Kickstarter right now and I'm gonna be doing a rules school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I've placed a link for that Kickstarter project in the description of this video so you can jump straight there and I've also placed uh, timestamps below me so you can go to a certain section of the rules if you want to jump right to it. Without further ado, let's get started. Buru is a competitive midway Euro style board game for one to four players where you're trying to win the Islanders to steam to become the new governor of Buru. Over the course of the game, players are going to be secretly deploying their explorers out into different regions of the board. Then each region will resolve and whoever has the highest power will be triumphant. They'll be getting powerful totems and they'll be able to be the first player to take actions in that region, like gaining resources in the forest or gathering islanders at the shore or at the village, you're able to task those islanders and do different things like turn some resources into others. And at the sacred lake, you can also spend resources to pay tribute, which will give you a hidden amount of esteem at the end of the game. But you can also gain elders there too, gaining you a certain esteem for a certain amount of resources or maybe a certain amount of islanders in your tableau. And you're trying to have the most esteem at the end of five rounds. I'm gonna teach you how to set up and play the main base game for three or four players. Keep in mind that since this is on Kickstarter now, that the final components may vary slightly from what you see in this video. First, place the board in the middle of the table where everyone can reach it. Off to the side of the board of where you see the forest, you're going to place the different resources. We have palm, clay, and ebony. Each player is going to select a color. You'll get yourself a player mat and you'll place your five explorer tokens with the face facing you, not the numbers, on your board like this. You'll take one of your fish tokens and place it on the zero. You'll take the other one and place it just off your mat on the right. Each player will also take their esteem marker and place it on the board where the zero of esteem is. This essentially is points in the game. Any colors that you're not using because you're playing with less than four players, all of those components can be left back in the box. You won't need them. In the middle of the board, you will see what the spirit totems look like of the different types. You'll place the actual totems on those corresponding spots as shown. Next, find the shore region of the board. Find these Islander cards, shuffle them up, and place them in a stack at the beginning of that shore region like this. Next, draw three cards from that Islander deck and place them face up next to the board like this. Next, locate the sacred lake section of the board, and just off to the side of that, you're going to place the three spirit altars with either side facing up. You're then going to find the three different tribute decks. You're going to shuffle them and place them on the corresponding altar as shown on the back of the cards and the logos on that altar card. And just about straddling where the zero esteem space is, you're going to shuffle the elder cards and the forest cards and place them as you see face down like this. Lastly, you'll find the decree tokens, shuffle them up and place 10 of them face down in the middle of the board like this. Any decree tokens not used can be placed back in the box without looking at them. The object of the game is to win the most Islanders esteem in the end, and that's tracked on the outside spot of the board. We're gonna show you in detail the different ways to gain esteem as we work through this video. The game is played over five rounds, and each of those rounds are divided into five phases. Now the first phase is the dawn phase, and at the beginning of the game, before you start this phase, you will give the emissary marker to the player who is the most diplomatic or a random player. That emissary marker is the first player marker. All other players will gain three fish. Now this is only done at the very beginning of the game and players will track their fish on their board like this. If you ever get past 10, let's say you have 13, you would come to the three and you would place your other fish that's off the side of your board on the plus 10. So this is 10 plus three, this would be 13. But again, at the beginning, all other players that don't have the emissary marker 
have three fish. In the dawn phase, the emissary prepares the board for the coming round. First, they're going to reveal the decrees. They're going to take the top two decrees, flip them over, and place them in the corresponding spots. For example, it might say the shore, and you'll place it in the middle region here in the shore. This is a bonus that we'll go over later on how you get it and what happens. The decrees might also have a spirit altar name, like Altar of Vanu. That one's placed face up next to that corresponding altar. Again, we'll talk about how these work later. Next, you will fill the forest. Now, at the beginning of the game, there won't be any cards out. You're going to take one card from the top of the stack and place it face up next to the forest of the board like this. You'll use one card for every player. So three players, there'll be three cards. Four players like that, there'll be four cards. In subsequent rounds, if there are still cards here for previous rounds, you will remove those, discard them, and then fill it up as I just mentioned. And if this forest deck ever were to run out, you shuffle the discards to form a new deck. Then you'll move to the morning phase, beginning with the player with the emissary token, and proceeding clockwise, the players are going to take turns placing their explorers into Buru's regions. And these regions are labeled on the board as the forest, the shore, the village, and the sacred lake. So again, starting from the emissary player and going clockwise, each player is going to take one of their explorers and place it on one of those regions. Now, your explorers, you can look at any time. They have numbers between one and five on the back of there. And again, you can look at these any time, but you're always going to place them face down because what's on the back of those is secret. So for example, maybe I place it face down in the forest region and you place it just in the middle part of that section, just like that. Essentially, you are planning for power of taking certain actions in certain regions, and that power is going to be based on the number on the back of that. Now, players will continue doing this in clockwise order, only placing one at a time until all players only have one explorer left on their board, meaning players are placing out four of their explorers. Keeping in mind that even though you're only placing one at a time, you can't have more than one in any region. Then you'll go to the noon phase. Now, each player's last explorer fishes to feed the party. You'll reveal this and you will get that much fish. So we're going to go up three fish. We had zero because we were the start player. There we have it. Then you'll go to the afternoon phase where explorers are revealed and players will be taking actions. Starting with the forest area and going clockwise, we will find out who has the most power and have players take actions. So in this example, the red player has a power of three, the white has a power of one, so the red player is known as being triumphant in this region. If there's a tie, it goes to the emissary player, if that player is part of that tie. If not, it's the player that's closest to this uh, in a clockwise fashion that would have the most power for the tiebreaker. Now, the triumphant player is going to get the totem for that region. In this case, it's the forest. They will take this and place this in front of them. This is going to earn that player esteem when any player pays tribute to that spirit altar later that we'll show you. It also will improve some of the effects of islanders that we'll go over later as well. Then, going in power order, the players are going to take their explorers, stack them, and place them in one of the spots that corresponds with that region. In the forest uh, section, it doesn't matter which one of these you choose because you are just simply going to select from one of the available cards. Now, these cards are going to give you resources, and the value of these cards are shown at the bottom here. This has zero dots filled in. This one has three, so this one is clearly more valuable than that one because this one allows you to take a clay and an ebony, where this allows you to take a palm or a clay. So if I did want this, I would simply discard the card and take these resources. And you can place those resources on your player mat. Then the player with the next power goes and so on and so forth, and they'll select one of the cards, keeping in mind that this does not refill when a player takes one during the round. You'll continue doing this for each of the regions in clockwise order. So in this case, the pink player is triumphant in the region. Again, they will get this totem in front of them, and if it has a decree token, they will get that bonus as well. So in this case, the pink player is going to get two fish, and then they discard this out of the game. Now, when selecting actions, again, going in power order, pink will go first. When they select one of the action spots, now you'll see that there are certain red dots there. Again, the, the one with more is typically more useful. Now, these spots allow you to take Islander cards from the face-up spots here. Now, these two allow you to take a single card. This one allows you to take a single card. Uh, you also can recycle, which is discard the face-up cards and bring three ones out, and those can be done in any order. This one is you can take two of them. As soon as you take the first one, 
you can refill the market so there's three face up. This one allows you to take two and recycle the market, and again, this can be done in any order. You could claim two, then cycle, or cycle, then claim two, or claim one, cycle, and claim another. And this goes for all of the action spots, no matter the region of the board, that you can apply any, all, or none of the effects shown in any order. Again, you continue going in power order after each player's action is completed, and you, if it's a tie like this, you would use that emissary token marker to see who would go next. In this case, the red player has it, so they'd go. If they didn't have it, it's the player closest to that. Now, when gaining an Islander card, you must pay the fish cost in the upper right, again, modifying the fish count on your board. Now, these cards are placed upright in a vertical orientation known as untasked, and the Islander is now part of your tableau. Now, the player that's triumphant in the village will take that corresponding totem, and then they would, again, select one of the actions available. And these actions are essentially the hands are tasking your Islanders that we just showed you how to get, and additionally, they're getting you fish. And when gaining fish, you can never have more than 20. Now, when a player tasks an Islander, it depends on what the card says. If it just has resources like this, when you task it, you turn it horizontally. In this case, you'd gain two fish. Now, if it looks something like this, you can do this or this. In this case, you can discard one palm to get an ebony or one palm to get two clay. And again, anytime you task it, you turn it sideways. A benefit with a scroll is a continuing effect. When tasked, in this case, if you pay tribute to this altar, then you'll get a palm. Now, we'll talk about uh, paying tribute in the next section. Something like this allows you to pay tribute to one of these three spirit altars when you task it. We're going to go over that action in just a moment. Earlier, we told you having the totem can give you other benefits. Like with this one, when you task, you can get one esteem, which essentially is a point. Or if you have this, you can get two instead. So because I have this, I task this, and I got two esteem. Anytime you gain esteem, you'll be going up the track alongside the board. Now, when moving on to the Sacred Lake, whoever has the most power will get one esteem. Now, the actions have to do with paying tribute, which is this icon, like once or twice, gaining elder cards, and or getting the emissary token, which again is the start or the first player marker. When paying tribute, you choose one of the spirits, you look at the altar, and you'll pay certain resources. Like, for example, this one is pay two palms and ebony and three fish, and you get to draw one of the tribute cards from that spirit's deck. And if there's a decree face up, you also get this. When you pay this tribute, you will gain a fish. Now, this stays face up now for all players to possibly use this round. If there are no more cards in this deck, you cannot pay tribute to that spirit. When you gain one of these tribute cards, you can look at it, but keep it face down in front of you because you don't want your opponents to see how much esteem you're going to get for that card at the end of the game. Also, anytime anyone pays tribute to a certain spirit, the player that has that totem in front of them will gain one esteem. This happens for every time that a player does that, well, as long as they have that totem in front of them. Now, if you're selecting an action that allows you to take Elder Cards, you take the top two, you look at them, you'll select one of them, and you'll place the one that you did not select at the bottom of that deck. And if that deck is empty, you cannot gain an Elder Card. Now, these are kept face down in front of you because they are secret goals, because at the end of the game, like if you have two, four, or six palms, you'll get one, two, or three esteem. Or four, six, or seven islanders in your tableau, you'll get one, two, or three esteem. But you don't want anyone else to see these, but you can look at them, anytime you want. After all the regions have been resolved, you go to the desk phase where first you discard all face-up decrees out of the game. You then take all of your explorers off the board and make sure that they're all on your player mat, all face down. Any tasked islanders that you have in front of you, all of them get untasked. Players keep the totems they've earned in front of them because in a future round, somebody else might be triumphant in that area and take that totem from them. If there are still decree tokens on the board face down in the middle, that means the game's not yet over and you'll continue through the morning phase and then through all five phases as I already showed you. If there are no decree tokens left, that means it's the end of the game. At this point, players are at a specific spot on the esteem track and to that they're going to add any esteem from tribute cards you had gotten throughout the game. And you'll get points for any elder cards that you have. I've already described how these work. And at that point, the player with the highest esteem wins and is crowned the new governor of Buru. Now, if there's a tie and the tied player has the emissary token, they win. If they don't have it, then the tied player closest in clockwise order to the emissary token wins. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into Buru. Now, I placed a link below me for the Kickstarter project page, and I'm sure that Crafty Games would love your support. 
Also, if you have any further questions about the rules, I placed the link below me just for that as well. And that's the best place to ask them because not only will I be notified, but so will Crafty Games.